started and I believe it's now law that I have to tell you that we're recording. So um, so we're all recording. Don't say anything you wouldn't want uh, repeated. Okay. All right. So let me uh, share screen. Yep. So I will tell you my computer is, my screen is very, very tiny. So I'm having trouble seeing everything, but I think Yeah, we can see that. You can see that. <laughs> um, Do you yeah. see? Oh, now it's this. Um, uh, let's try that. One second, everyone. Um, Extend desktop. There we go. So, all right. I think here. you. One second. Um, we. This is the problem. It works in here and it doesn't online. Um, so this is what this is what everyone else is seeing. Um, mm. Let's try something else. It's not not the best, but. So if you can see that, um, yeah. I can live with that. Yes. Well, okay. Let me, let me show you how it works. Okay. A little bit bigger for you. Yep. If you want to. Okay. We can see it from here. Yep. All right. So you all can see. Can you hear me? Yes. I can't hear you. Can. Okay. Can someone out there tell me that you hear me? I can hear you. I can hear you. This is Alice. Okay. All right. Now I I'll hear that. Where again. is that sound coming from? All right. Would you, can you turn up the TV at all? All right, well, I will go ahead uh, and begin. Uh, so today we are talking about the next step in our four-step uh, course on Celtic Christianity. Um, and today we're going to talk specifically about the Romanization of Christianity in uh, the British Isles. And we're gonna talk about a famous event that happened in the year 664 called the uh, Synod of Whitby. Um, I don't know if you know about the Senate of Whitby, we'll talk about it. Um, but British historians say that it's the most important thing that happened in Britain in the first millennium. Uh, so uh, very, uh, very important event. Um, I'm going to go back through and kind of talk about uh, some of what Father Michael presented last week, uh, talking about the origins of Celtic Christianity, uh, or maybe better said, just the origins of Christianity uh, in Britain before uh, the year 600. Um, and then next week, he will talk about the rediscovery of this type of uh, Christianity uh, in the 16th century, in the 19th century. Um, and then on October the 10th, uh, we'll talk about it in contemporary use. I will be leading that week's forum. Um, so we begin with the idea that Christianity was introduced into Britain essentially twice. Uh, the first time that it came, it came unofficially. So it came with uh, the Romans uh, who uh, had, had moved up into Britain as far as the Scottish border, uh, all the way to Hadrian's Wall. Um, and there was no official mission uh, to Britain at that point. It was a very organic movement uh, as Roman soldiers and other Roman officials, uh, citizens moved into Britain, Christianity came uh, very naturally with them. We believe based on uh, some, of their, uh, some of their claims that they would make four and 500 years ago that it might have come from Ephesus because they, uh, Celtic Christians, uh, the Christians of this era uh, have a real connection with St. John, uh, St. John the Apostle uh, and Evangelist of the Fourth Gospel. Um, and so the idea is that uh, 
if that tradition is rooted in something historical, then it's probably that whoever the first Christians coming into England around uh, 150 would have had a connection with uh, Ephesus, maybe with John himself, maybe with Polycarp, who was the second bishop there, maybe just with that tradition. Uh, but we do know that the first martyr in England was St. Alban, uh, and he was martyred outside of uh, present day London. He was a deacon, uh, and so we can kind of extrapolate from that that if he, uh, a deacon, was martyred in 150 as a Christian, uh, that certainly uh, he either was the very first or uh, there were others with him. But that gives us a firm date of knowing when Christianity certainly had come into uh, what we now know as the, the British realm. And this continues uh, from 150 onward. In the 200s, in the 300s, uh, the, the Britons, the people of this uh, area, are converting. And really, Christianity takes pretty strong hold uh, in the area under the the Roman occupation. And it spreads out as far as uh, Scotland, but certainly into Ireland. Uh, Patrick goes as the missionary uh, to the Irish. There are bishops all throughout the, uh, the British and Irish uh, realm. And uh, they develop what you might call their own ecclesiastical language. And it's a mixture uh, of the local Gaelic uh, indigenous language along with Latin. And so what we think that that means is that with the Roman occupation, Latin is coming in. The people who uh, are bringing Christianity into Britain in that time, <clears throat> whatever it is that they have of Christianity is coming in Latin, but it's slowly kind of mixing with the indigenous Gaelic languages uh, of Britain and, uh, and of Ireland. However, end of the fourth century, uh, beginning of the fifth century, uh, the Romans are uh, losing control of the empire and they withdraw uh, from Britain. And this really causes a very uh, big change in the trajectory of Christianity in, uh, in that area because it brings in terrible, terrible instability. Uh, into the place that we now know uh, as England, and Michael covered this uh, last week. But because of the Roman uh, departure, the British, not British, Britain Christians uh, in every facet of life uh, were threatened all around. And because of that, the Christianity that they knew uh, was also threatened. So after the Romans depart, uh, the Britain Christians uh, are on the move. And you can see on the right side where they kind of end up along the Western coast uh, and in Northern France. Um, but one of the reasons that they end up there is kind of funny. So after the, um, after the Romans are gone, the Britons who are a very simple uh, agrarian society, they need help. So they're being invaded uh, by their brethren to the North whom we now know as the Scottish. Uh, they're being invaded by uh, Nordic people from what we now know as Denmark, from, uh, from Norway, and they're really uh, having a terrible time. I mean, people are coming in, burning their villages, uh, killing their children, carrying away uh, their, their daughters and their wives. Um, and so the Britons, as best they can, uh, find a group of people in what we know as Northern Germany, um, the Angles and the Saxons. Now, the Angles and the Saxons are not Roman, uh, and because of that, they are also not, uh, not Christian, but they are very interested in the idea of coming and settling along the eastern coast. So the Britons invite the Angles and the Saxon, Saxons uh, and the Jutes uh, from, uh, from Jutland in, uh, in Denmark to come and settle along the coast. And, and what the Britons are hoping for at that point is that the Angles and the Saxons and the Utes will, will create a barrier along the coast so that they can uh, live in peace. And so the Angles and the Saxons, they take them up on their offer to settle along the coast. 
And then almost immediately, because the Britons are so weak, they start moving inland. And so you can kind of think of the way that uh, the original, uh, the pilgrims came to, uh, to the coast and settled along Cape Cod and settled in Plymouth, but it wasn't very long before Rhode Island was being developed and, and uh, we, our people, uh, were moving inland. So that's what happened with the Angles and the Saxons. They were invited to come and live along the coast, uh, but very quickly they take much more land than the Britons who invited them to come ever, uh, ever intended. And this creates something very important in our narrative today. The Britons, as they move inward, as they move uh, westward, they also become resentful because they invited the Angles and the Saxons to come, Saxons to come and live along the coast and they've given them an inch and they've taken uh, a foot or 300 miles. And because of this, the, uh, the Celtic Christians, the Britain Christians, who otherwise would have immediately begun evangelizing the Angles and the Saxons, come to resent them. And they refuse to evangelize them because they see them now as they're not uh, supporting them. These are pagan invaders who have taken over much more than they ever intended for them to have. And I would say that might be the one, uh, the one thing as we move forward 200 years uh, after the, the Angles and the Saxons move in, uh, that's going to make a key difference. It's the reason that the Roman church sends uh, an evangelism team into uh, Anglo-Saxony because the Celtic Christians who resented the Angles and the Saxons refused to evangelize them. All right, so a couple of hundred years pass as the Anglo-Saxons are setting up their kingdoms along the coast and are moving inland. And what we call Celtic Christians or Britons are forced inland. Uh, the word Wales, uh, not in Welsh, but in, uh, in, in English and from Latin, uh, comes from a word that kind of means Roman refugees. So it was the people who, after the Roman Empire uh, fell, had to scatter, and they carried the, the vestiges of the Roman Empire with them. But they have now been pushed, as you can see in the picture uh, uh, of England over to the right, uh, they have all been pushed all the way to the western side of what we now know as Britain. So they're definitely in Wales, they're down in Cornwall, they're up along the coast. Um, but all the way on the, on the east side, all the way down the coast and then across the bottom, uh, the Angles and the Saxons have set up uh, their kingdoms and they're really pretty much in place by the 500s. And so what we know as Britain is a very uh, divided place. And then in the middle, you have this mixture where the East Coast is Anglo-Saxon, the West Coast is Britain, and the middle part is where they, they kind of mix. That's the case uh, for uh, geography and ethnography uh, towards the end of the 500s. Well, Gregory the Great, who was going to be Pope uh, in the, the beginning of the 600s, Gregory the Great finds out or figures out that the East Coast uh, of England is not evangelized at all, that it's still completely pagan, that when uh, the Anglo-Saxons left what we now call Germany and Denmark and moved over there, no one evangelized them. And there's a, there's a fascinating story. So Gregory the Great is at the market in Rome. He's not yet Pope, he's going to be Pope. Um, and he sees these two little slave boys that he thinks look like angels. They have blonde hair, uh, they have blue eyes, and he asks where they're from. And he's, I, I think he's, he's concerned that they're, that they're slaves. Uh, and he's told that they look, that they are angles. And Gregory the Great is said to have made uh, kind of a, a play on words. And he says, they shouldn't be angles, they should be angels. 
And that's the day, because of these two little slave boys, uh, that he becomes concerned about the fact that all of uh, Anglo-Saxony is not being uh, converted. So in the year uh, right around 600, once he is the Pope, one of the first things that he does is he finds uh, Augustine, who is also a bishop, and he sends Augustine uh, to, to evangelize the Anglo-Saxons. And this was also a strategic move on, on the part of Gregory. Instead of sending priests and deacons, he sends a bishop. And if you send a bishop, then they can also build churches and ordain other priests and deacons. If you send a priest and deacon, they can baptize, they can convert, they can preach, they can teach, uh, but they can't ordain other people. They can't consecrate churches. And so Gregory uh, really believes that the Anglo-Saxons can be converted in pretty short order. Uh, and it turns out that he's right. Now, there are a couple of reasons that he was right about it. Number one, a lot of the Anglo-Saxon royalty has uh, a lot of contact with uh, the continent. So these people, half of the royalty uh, among Anglo-Saxons are all from France or Gaul, and they've already been converted. So every time a new princess shows up uh, in uh, Wessex, there's a good chance that she's already uh, Christian. So it's a pretty easy job that Augustine has of converting uh, the Anglo-Saxons. When he gets to Canterbury, when he gets to Kent, uh, he finds that the king is not Christian, but the queen already is. And so it's really, uh, it's an easier job of evangelism, if you can call it that, uh, converting the Anglo-Saxons and, uh, and setting up a Christian church there. But of course, Augustine of Canterbury is sent by Gregory in Rome. And so when he goes into East Anglia and uh, Saxony, when he converts people and when he sets up churches, uh, he sets them up according to the Roman tradition. So what ends up happening in the, in the 600s is that along the eastern coast, you have what we would call Roman Christianity being set up uh, systematically and intentionally by Augustine of Canterbury, although he doesn't live very long, uh, by Augustine of Canterbury and those who follow him. Uh, and it really creates a rival uh, East Coast versus West Coast of these two different types of Christianity. Yeah. One that is intentional, methodical, organized, and one that's a little bit earthier. It lives in the monasteries, uh, not intentional and methodical. And then in the middle, you have this overlap because if you're on the East Coast, people are definitely Roman Christian. If you're on the West Coast, they are definitely Britain or Celtic Christian. But in the middle, that's where these two kind of overlap. Uh, and it's a very mixed neighborhood. So that among the Christians, half of them are following one tradition and half are following another. Now you have to ask yourself, what is it about each other that uh, might bother them? What would bother you if you were an Anglo-Saxon Roman Christian and you were married to a Celtic Christian? Or other way around, what if you were a Celtic Christian and you were married to an Anglo-Saxon Roman Christian? What would bother you about that? The list that they come up with, I think is really kind of funny because it's not what uh, would be at the top of my list. Uh, but the things that bother them are the dating of Easter, and the way that monks look. So we talked about the tonsure last week about how the um, about how the monks would cut their hair, and that the Celtic monks kind of have a mullet uh, coming down in the back. To the Anglo-Saxons and to anyone from continental Europe, the Celtic monks look like hoodlums. They look like barbarians, and people just can't get past the fact that they look like barbarians. How often have I heard this? How often have we heard this in the Episcopal Church that the music was wonderful and the sermon was inspiring and the offertory anthem was really beyond, but that tenor, he really needs to get a haircut. He really needs to, to brush his hair before the service because those things distract us. 
And that's what it seems like was going on uh, with the Celtic monks was that they looked like barbarians and the Anglo-Saxons who at this point are a little more uh, cosmopolitan uh, just have trouble with the way that the Celtic monks look like barbarians. The other side that I think is very easy for us to understand is that the Celtic Christians were on a different schedule for dating Easter than the Anglo-Saxons. So by the year 600, uh, Western Christianity had developed a 19 year cycle uh, for finding the date of Easter. It was always on a Sunday, which is important, uh, but it was always the first Sunday after the spring equinox after the first full moon. So they had kind of taken two or three things from the gospels and said, clearly it was after the spring equinox and there was a full moon, right? Because we remember the, uh, the stories from the gospel and the cock was crowing in the middle of the night and, and all of that. And Jesus rose from the dead on a Sunday. It says that in the gospels, it was the first day of the week. And so Roman Christianity had created this 19 year cycle. It was developed in Alexandria uh, for setting the date of Easter. Celtic Christianity was using a different date and we're not sure of which cycle precisely they were using. And it's even possible that depending on where you went, they were using a couple of different cycles. So the very first date of Easter was the beginning of Passover. Uh, so in Judaism, Passover begins on the 14th of Nisan, Nisan. Um, and that was it. And so the earliest Christians said, uh, Good Friday, Easter was at Passover. And so that's when they celebrated it. However, the 14th of Nisan can happen on a Tuesday. It can happen on a Friday. And because the Jewish calendar is lunar, and has an extra month thrown in every 13 years, you might be celebrating uh, Easter on a Tuesday in March. You might be celebrating it on a Thursday in May. Later, there was a, 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 an update uh, where Easter was put on kind of a 50-day calendar, uh, which I think is what the Orthodox still use. So it was more loosely uh, tied to Passover, but they wanted it to be on a Sunday because people said that was also very important. And then the Christians in Alexandria developed that a little bit more to say, no, it needs to be the first Sunday after the first full moon after the spring equinox. And that was established. All right. Does this sound trivial or does this sound important? Well, it might be trivial if you have no contact with someone else, right? Like if someone told you that people in New Zealand celebrate uh, Easter in October, well, unless you go to New Zealand, it, maybe it doesn't matter, right? It's springtime there, let people in New Zealand do uh, whatever they want. But if you're married to someone from New Zealand and they're celebrating uh, Easter at a different time than you are, then it becomes a little bit problematic. And that's what's happening here in uh, these middle parts, especially up here in the north, in the area called uh, Northumbria. Um, they're celebrating Easter at different times. Uh, and so imagine yourself, you're married, and you begin Lent, and your spouse has not yet begun Lent. And so you've now given up milk and eggs and cheese, and every morning you watch your spouse eating milk and eggs and cheese. However, 40 days later, you get to Easter, uh, your spouse has now just started giving up milk and eggs and cheese, and you're eating ham and bacon and, uh, and having a little bit too much mead every night before you go to bed because you're celebrating. And that seems to be the biggest sticking point between these two traditions. Now, there are other points, like if you look at this picture that I have on the left, the left side is a picture of a Celtic bishop. And they don't wear miters going up, they wear crowns around their head to reflect the, the kingship of Christ. 
another thing that a Celtic bishop would do is he would wear his stole like a deacon, reflecting uh, the diaconal ministry of caring for uh, the poor of the earth that is preserved with the bishop. On the, on the right side, we see other things. You, you have the mitre, you, the, the bishop is not wearing the deacon stole, the bishop is wearing a priest stole. Ironically, none of that seems to have bothered people. It was the dating of Easter and the fact that Celtic monks looked like barbarians that they just could not get past. So, we have a man named King Oswy, and King Oswy is the, the king of Northumbria, and King Oswy, in the middle of the 600s, in the middle of the 7th century, decides that this has to be solved. And he really says that it's the Easter debate that, uh, that has to be solved, because in his part of Northumbria, you have people who are celebrating Easter at different times, and it's really causing problems. Um, and by that, we mean Oswe and his wife are celebrating Easter at different times, uh, and it's really driving them crazy. So Oswe calls the Synod of Whitby, where he announces that he's going to decide once and for all, he, the king of Northumbria, is going to decide once and for all uh, the date of Easter as it should be celebrated, but they're going to come up with a single date. Uh, so this picture up at the top is uh, from Whitby Abbey. Unfortunately, this Whitby Abbey was not uh, built for another 500 years. It didn't look like that at all. Uh, think Iowa. It looked more like farmhouses at the time of the Senate of Whitby. Um, but King Oswe invites both sides Celtic bishops and monks, Anglo-Saxon bishop, monks, more like clerics, he invites them all to meet at Whitby Abbey. Um, and because uh, his wife is a Celtic Christian, he actually kind of defers to the Celts in the beginning. Putting it at Whitby uh, was putting the ball in their court. So Whitby Abbey is a Celtic abbey. And it's run by a woman, which the, the Romans probably would not have let happen because the woman is in charge of uh, people of both genders. Uh, uh, her name is Hilda. So Hilda of Whitby is a very famous and powerful abbess. Um, and by putting the Senate of Whitby there, he's really giving the upper hand uh, to Celtic Christians. Uh, but something very different is going to play out. So the information that we have about the, the Synod of Whitby is all written by the Venerable Bede. So the Venerable Bede uh, is a monk who lives about 50 years after all of this, 40 or 50 years after this. Uh, and he is clearly fascinated by the Synod of Whitby. Uh, and so Bede gives us uh, an account of everything that happened there. Now, the two things to say about Bede are, uh, number one, he is writing 40 or 50 years later so it's kind of a secondhand account. He was not there, but he knows people who were there. And so his information is considered by historians to be pretty good. But you know, history is always written by the winners, right? And that's the thing about the Venerable Bede that we still have to wonder about because Bede is an Anglo-Saxon Christian. And Bede looks back at the Synod of Whitby as finally solving correctly what had plagued Britain before the Senate of Whitby. And so Bede, as he's writing, you can tell he's just so excited that they're going to settle this once and for all. Um, so that's where Bede's writing is a little bit colored, but it's the year 664. There's nobody else to report on this. So we're grateful that we have the, the venerable Bede and his ecclesiastical history of the English people uh, to give us an idea of what happened. All right, so King Oswy calls the Synod of Whitby. Uh, so you can see in this background, that gives you more of an idea of what Whitby probably looked like uh, when, uh, when the Synod happened. So on the Celtic side, there were three very important, uh, I'm sorry, two very important people. Uh, the one in the middle is Hilda, 
And she is the abbess of Whitby. And she's absolutely following the Celtic tradition in her abbey. And then the other most important person uh, is Coleman. And Coleman is the current Bishop of Northumbria. Um, he's in Lindisfarne. Uh, and uh, the two of them, along with one other person, I can't, I don't remember who the other person was, um, are making the argument for why Celtic Christianity is, if you have to pick between the two, you ought to pick this, you ought to pick our day for Easter, you ought to ask your monks to dress the way that ours do, cut their hair the way that ours do, uh, and they get to make their case. Um, and essentially their case is that Celtic Christianity is an apostolic form of Christianity. It goes all the way back to St. John. The first Christians who came into Britain uh, were carrying the apostolic tradition of John, who himself was, was an apostle and knew Jesus. Um, they pointed out that monastic life, as it existed in Iona, as it existed in Whitby, where they were, as it, exists, as it existed all of these places, um, was the thing that preserved Christianity after the Romans left. So the Romans left, the whole place collapsed. They had to bring in Germans of all people to protect them who took their land. And yet Celtic Christianity was the one thing that connected all of the people over the last five centuries with the first Christians who had come uh, into Britain around 150. And then the final part of their argument had to do with St. Columba. You remember St. Columba is the one who sets up the monastery at Iona. And St. Columba was the George Washington of, uh, of uh, Celtic Christians. Father, I cannot tell a lie. Columba was truly a person of holiness and uh, of such reputation that they said any kind of Christianity that derives from Columba is who we are. Columba was one of us. Columba set up these monasteries in order to preserve the true Christian message. And you cannot convince us that anything uh, out, of that, out of that tradition is not who we're supposed to be. So that was the Celtic argument. On the other side, we have the Roman argument. Uh, you can call it the Roman argument, you can call it the Anglo-Saxon argument, um, but it's the, it's the case of those on the east side of the country. Um, and so they bring in Bishop Agebert, uh, who is from, I believe, East Anglia or Kent, somewhere down there. Uh, they bring in Prince Alchfert, who is the son of King Oswy. But remember, King Oswy is married to a Celtic Christian woman. And so I think the idea, I think the idea in inviting him is that he could be persuaded either way. However, uh, Prince Alfred uh, has gone and he studied on the continent. And it was while he was gone uh, that he decides that continental Christianity really is uh, the much more thoughtful and uh, correct form. And then we have uh, someone named uh, Romanus uh, who is a chaplain, uh, who is a monk, uh, but he's, he's a very well-educated chaplain and monk. And so the three of them make up the team that's going to make uh, the Roman argument. And the Roman argument goes something like this. Peter and Paul, chief apostles, lived, taught, suffered, and are buried in Rome. And so whatever the practice is in Rome, that really should be uh, instructional for the rest of Christians. Uh, Rome is the, the central point of Christianity. Uh, and it's not just that it's in Rome, but Rome kind of represents the universal practice, going as far as Egypt, right? So this is, this is definitely a Catholic argument in the sense of a, a universal argument uh, Roman Christianity is the Christianity that is everywhere. Celtic Christianity is the Christianity that's here, but here is very different than everywhere else, and we think we ought to be doing what everyone else is doing, especially what Christians in Rome are doing. The next point that they make out is that John was an apostle, and that 
absolutely, this is where the Celtic or Britain tradition came from. However, that represented a particular point in time. So the Johannine Christianity was introduced into England around 150. But since then, the church in Europe on the continent has been making uh, progress. Think of the Council of Nicaea, where they defined what it was to, uh, to have Christian belief. Think of the Council of Chalcedon, where they've identified books of scripture, uh, what it is that makes up the Old Testament and the New Testament. We can say that John and his version of Christianity was introduced into England in the year 150, and that's absolutely true. But Christianity didn't stop there. It's been uh, developing, and we need to be a part of that development. And then the last thing that they have to say is about Columba. So everybody loves Columba, right? And if you get up and you make an argument that there's something wrong with Columba, you're going to lose the argument. And so the final thing that they say is that uh, Columba did the best that he could. That's right. Columba was a saint. Columba was a monk among monks and we have no problem with Columba. We just know that Columba was doing the best that he could with what he had, um, but he didn't know about European Christianity. He didn't know that they had settled the Easter debate. He didn't know that they had put Easter onto a Sunday after the spring equinox for a reason so that everybody could be celebrating the same way. And you know, if Columba really was this holy person, Columba probably would have wanted to be celebrating Easter with everyone else. If Columba had known that his monks looked like barbarians, he would have asked them to get a haircut. All right, so the last part's not really historically true, but that's what they're arguing about Columba, that if Columba had the information uh, that they had, he would have followed this tradition too. So the Synod of Whitby plays out in this way. So right there in the middle is King Oswy king of Northumbria, and he goes back and forth between the two groups. The way it is in this picture, you have the Anglo-Saxon European Roman uh, party on the left, and then on the right, you have the Celtic party, and they're making their arguments, and Oswy goes back and forth and back and forth, and he's most impressed by this argument about Rome being uh, the tradition of Peter and Paul. And Oswy seems to know the scriptures pretty well. And he says, in Matthew's gospel, uh, Jesus gives the keys of heaven to Peter. And they say, yes, that's right. Both sides agree with that. And Oswy says, so if Peter had the keys, he would have taken them with him to Rome. And probably at this point, one side is agreeing with him more than the other. And finally, Oswe says, if I have to choose, then I'm going to go with the side that is in keeping with St. Peter, who received the keys to the kingdom. And so it is, that is what uh, influences Oswe. That's the argument that wins the day, uh, is that Rome is the inheritance of the Petrine tradition. Uh, and he never actually says anything uh, detrimental about Celtic Christianity, about the arguments that they've made, but he says that's the winning argument. So we are going to celebrate Easter the same day uh, that they do in Rome, and our monks are going to shave their heads the same way that they do in Rome. Now it's interesting, that's actually all that Oswe says. So at the Synod of Whitby, he doesn't say a whole lot, except we're going to celebrate Easter on this date, and our monks are going to cut their hair this way, the way that it's done in Rome. That's it. But of course, what we know is his decision makes a much bigger difference in the identity of Christianity, not just with the date of Easter, not just with uh, the, the tonsure. It has ramifications that go much beyond that, because essentially he has chosen uh, the Anglo-Saxon continental Roman form of Christianity over the Celtic one and says that's going to be uh, the Christianity of Northumbria 
of Britain of this island. So the Celts uh, have lost. Now, the interesting thing is uh, some of the Celtic Christians leave the Synod of Whitby uh, feeling very disappointed, feeling like they have lost and they retreat to their monasteries uh, where, they, where they continue to try and preserve this, this form of Christianity, this way of life. It's not actually true though of all of them. Uh, so Hilda, for example, remember Hilda, who is the abbess uh, of Whitby, uh, Hilda says, okay, well, then we have a decision. And so now the, uh, the abbey at Whitby uh, is going to follow the Roman date for Easter. The, the monks all get haircuts. Uh, and I think that's how uh, Whitby ends up looking, do you remember that picture? There it is. That's how uh, Whitby Abbey is going to end up looking like this 500 years later, uh, because Hilda doesn't feel like this is a defeat. It's a new direction uh, for Christians on the island. Uh, and some of the Celtic Christians, uh, the story goes, were actually kind of relieved uh, that they would all be celebrating uh, Easter at the same time. So it wasn't their date that was chosen, but you know what? We're glad that we'll all have Easter the same time. Uh, that's fine. Not true of everyone. Uh, Coleman goes back to Lindisfarne. Uh, this other guy, I really should know who he is, goes back to Iona. Uh, and they, they have this idea that they're going to revive Celtic Christianity. Um, it doesn't really happen. And one of the reasons is while all of this is going on in the five and six hundreds, Parts of Ireland, parts of Wales, parts of Cornwall are also getting uh, the European continental influence. And so it's not as if everyone in Ireland is celebrating Easter on the Celtic date. Many of them are already using the Roman date. Uh, some of the monks in Ireland are already wearing the Roman tonsure so that they don't look like barbarians, so that they look like uh, monks uh, on the continent. And so when the, when the Celts leave, Bishop Coleman and the monk that goes back to Iona, um, they think that they're going to be able to preserve something. And it turns out people were not really all that interested in preserving it after, uh, after the Senate of Whitby. Um, all right, last slide. Um, so all of this has consequences. Uh, not just about the date of Easter and the tonsure, that's the official decision, right? So officially, that's all that the Synod of Whitby decided. However, it has much more uh, overarching effects. Um, so after this is over, remember Bishop Coleman goes back to Lindisfarne and says, we're, we're going to keep talking about this. We're going to, we're going to keep uh preserving some of Celtic Christianity. And so Aswi responds to that by saying, all right, well, then we're going to move the bishop's seat from Lindisfarne to York. And as we're going to ask for the replacement of the Bishop of York, not to be a Celtic bishop, but to be a Roman bishop. So slowly that takes maybe 20 years uh, but Lindisfarne is no longer the center of Christianity in Northumbria. York is. And you can actually see there on the left, that's a picture of uh, the cathedral in York, uh, which I think is a sign of the kind of long uh, reaching effects that uh, the Synod of Whitby had. It also created an English Catholicity. So now that the center of Northumbrian uh, Christianity is in York, York and Canterbury are united. And this was not true before, right? So the Bishop of the North, the great Bishop of the North was the Bishop of Lindisfarne. The Bishop of the South, the great Bishop of the South is the Bishop of Canterbury, but they're from opposite camps. And now for the first time, Canterbury and York are on the same page, something that's still true 1400 years later, that the Archbishop of Canterbury and the Archbishop of York are the two who lead the Church of England uh, and who lead the, the Anglican Communion. Um, another subsequent change is that as new bishops are coming in, there is an effort 
to bring in bishops from the continent. Now, whether this is a good thing or a bad thing um, is kind of up to you to decide. But there is a, there is a definite effort uh, to make sure that when a bishop dies, that the new bishop comes in from the continent so that there's no uh, disunity between the two sides. Finally, we get into the long lasting impacts of this. Um, because remember, all that King Oswe thought he was deciding was the date of Easter and the, uh, the monk's tonsure. Um, however, what it means in the long run is that English Catholicity for the next 700 years is going to be understood to mean Roman Catholicity. The two are absolutely uh, the same. And think of the life of Henry VIII. Henry VIII starts out as a protector of the Roman Catholic Church in England. Henry VIII is awarded this title of the protector of the faith because he writes a long paper in Latin about how English Catholicity is Roman Catholicity and Roman Catholicity is English Catholicity. And that persists for uh, about 800 years. However, because of the Synod of Whitby, something else is preserved that might not have been preserved or thought of otherwise. Who is it that makes that decision at the Synod of Whitby? They didn't vote. It was the king. And so you also have this precedent that King Henry VIII is going to rediscover after he's written his paper defending that English Catholicity and Roman Catholicity are the same, he's also going to go back and say, oh, but you know, it was the king who decided that. Well, that's interesting because I guess what that means is that in England, the king has the power to make that decision. Now, that wasn't a decision from the Synod of Whitby. That wasn't something uh, that they officially voted on. But Oswe, by setting up the synod and going back and forth, he was, the, he was the judge, he was the jury, he was the one who decided that the king could make this decision and he made it. And so fast forward eight or 900 years, England looks and says, no, actually the king is the one who can decide that for us. So that's also a, a long lasting impact. Um, the final thing is, it's possible, if the Synod of Whitby had not happened, that continental Christianity, uh, in this case, this kind of Roman uh, Anglo-Saxon Catholicity, would have overtaken Celtic tradition, period, right? So the Romans, even though the Roman Empire is kind of gone, are still much more educated, much more uh, organized. They read, they write it's very possible that that type of Christianity would have just taken over in Britain, in Ireland, and no one really would have known very much about Celtic Christianity and those traditions. However, because of the Synod of Whitby and because of the Venerable Bede writing about the Synod of Whitby, it's all preserved. Knowing that they believed their tradition to go all the way back to St. John, apostle and evangelist. Knowing the types of arguments that they made and about monastic life and about it being the center uh, of communal life and about Columba and how Columba had set these things up and had written prayers and had organized uh, Christianity around, this actually preserves that argument and a glimpse into uh, Celtic Christianity that we might not have had otherwise. Does that make sense? Be it's because of the Synod of Whitby, even though Celtic Christianity immediately kind of loses, it preserves it in the record so that if you go back and look, you can say they lost, however, uh, this was their argument. And so hundreds and hundreds of years later, uh, people are going to start making the argument again, you know, there's been a different kind of Christianity here on this island that goes all the way back to the year 150. Now, the first ones to make this argument uh, are, are the Scots after the Reformation, 
right? So Henry VIII, we know about the English Reformation, it kind of uh, gets reformed. Uh, Scottish theologians in the 15 and 1600s say, you know, maybe we're not beholden to anyone. <laughs> the, the, the Celtic Christianity, it was in monasteries, it was on the coast, there was no, the king was not in charge, the pope was not in charge, maybe we don't need either of them. I watched a fascinating video uh, this week of a guy who was a real, I mean, a real evangelical, and he has this, uh, this Bible college in Iona, and he says that it is the true uh, descendant of Iona, that Iona was a place to study the Bible and become a missionary. Now, that's his interpretation. I'll leave it up to you whether or not uh, you think he's, he's right. I think that he, he was a little bit off. But by preserving this other kind of English Christianity in the record, because of the Senate of Whitby, uh, it is preserved, and other people later are able to come back and say, oh, that's an option. We should, uh, we should consider that. 800, 14, 1300 years uh, after, uh, after the fact. All right. So that's the end of my presentation. Uh, questions, thoughts? I think we still have a few people around. Hello, it's Alice. Hello, Alice. Hi, um, come, I'll keep it brief. A couple of quick comments and questions. Um, the most recent th thing that you talked about, the argument that Henry VIII used, 